the recording, uh, Isaac. Morning, students. Today is is uh, what August eighteenth, and I'm, I really thank you for being patient and wait for me. Okay, uh, so we were discussing about secondary behavior, and uh, we presented uh, all of this material. This is very important because when we model a secondary structure, what we do is we convert. <clears throat> the combination of plate plus stiffeners into a group of beams. That's what we call the Grillich theory, okay? For that, we need to use the effective breadth, okay? That's the effective width of the plate, which is welded to the stiffener. And once you calculate that, you can calculate the effective inertia of the combination. And you can proceed to calculate the the the, com the, the response of the combination of uh, several uh, beams, okay? So that's the summary of that process. This table, it's very similar to results by Shady, but it's provided by DNV, okay? And this is specifically for girders. We will review that next week, okay? They present this table for girders. So those are the most important elements, right? The other ones, stiffness, they provide uh, just single value, to, to consider as an effective width. And we will see that, effective breadth, I'm sorry, for the stiffener, which are the smaller. Because it, it makes sense, right? If uh, one of these fails, one of the girders fails, that means that uh, the elements with, uh, which are attached to it, those are the stiffeners, and, and those are the good amount, probably they will fail too. So the, it's, it's going to start the collapse of the structure probably. Okay, now, uh, is we continue with this idea of modeling the this reinforced panel as a grillage, okay? What we can do is we can consider each one of the girders, like this one here, and each one of the stiffeners as beams, okay? In the case of the stiffeners, okay, they are assumed to receive the load, okay, from the pressure which is acting on the on the reinforced panel but also they are receiving the support by the girders. So they are, these, are, these two are unknown concentrated forces. These are the reactions exerted by the girders, okay? So they, they point upward, this is uniformly distributed, is equal to the pressure times the spacing between stiffeners. And the girders, they have these forces, but they are in the opposite direction. If we have enough, enough number of stiffeners, these uh, uh, forces are close to each other. And we can, in general, assume that this, they, they are uniformly distributed, okay? So it's, it's a different values because uh, the spacing between girders is different than the spacing between stiffeners, but it's, it's, a, it's a good model if the number of stiffeners is large enough. After we have done this modeling, this is the equation that we have to solve. It's a differential equation for the stiffeners. For each one, this here, you have several stiffeners. And here you have the loading downward, this, this distributed load. And also you have concentrated forces from the girders in the opposite direction. For the girders, we have something similar, but these forces act in the opposite direction. Okay, these are concentrated unknown forces of contact between stiffeners and girders. We need to, to find them. If we knew these forces uh, of contact, we could solve this system of equations using the boundary conditions, right? The problem is that we do not know these contact forces, okay? So what we need is to include a, a number of extra conditions. And these extra conditions are that the displacement at the points of contact coincide. So this uh, deflection of the case uh, stiffener has to coincide with the deflection of the girder at the point of contact, okay? That will provide a number of extra equations. So 
finally, we could calculate the contact forces. Okay, of course, you, you can imagine immediately, you can foresee that the, the number of equations increases uh, dramatically if we have a large number of girders and stiffeners, but that's what we have to do, okay? Uh, here I have an example. This is a very simple example. We have one girder here and two stiffeners, right? Now, immediately we see that we have a, a plane of symmetry, right? So that means that instead of considering the whole thing, what we can do is we consider only half of that. So we have only one contact force and we need only to specify one extra equation equaling the deflection of the stiffener and the girder and this point of contact in order to find this force of uh, this contact force. If we would include the whole thing, then we would need two conditions in order to find these two reactions, which at the end are the same, okay? So, this is what we're saying here. Uh, we have only one contact force, one, one. These are the boundary conditions. This is for the stiffener. So we assume that it's clamped here and also here. So deflection and slope in this direction, we have to be careful. This is the X direction for the stiffener, have to be equal to zero. And then for the girder, okay, we go from here only up to here. That's why we say that the domain for this equation is only from zero until half of A. Boundary conditions on this end, clamp it. Please be careful, this X for the girder means this direction, okay? This direction. Now, in here, we can apply symmetry conditions. And this is what we discussed, okay? We consider that here, in this direction, the slope is zero. But also, because of the symmetry, these forces are equal to those forces. So if we make any cut in between these two contact forces, the shear force has to be zero, okay? That's what we have here. EI of the girder times the third derivative of the girder has to be equal to zero. And this one extra unknown, this is F11, is a contact force. It will come to be determined, as we said before, equaling the deflection of the stiffener with the deflection of the girder at this point. So if we go from here to here, this is V over two. If we go in this direction, this point is A over three. So that's the quality that we need. We have to be careful because I sub S is different I sub G in general. So these are the equations that we implemented. You can do it at home. And these are the values that we took. So this is a numerical example. And you recognize the steel, young models of the steel. You see that there is a large difference between the inertia of the stiffener and the girder. The girder is about, what, seven times stiffer than the stiffener. Makes sense. Displacement or spacing, sorry, spacing between girders is much larger than the spacing between stiffeners. Pressure. These are typical units to express the, the pressure. If we multiply this times the spacing, so this is the loading acting on the stiffener, and we consider it as a uniform. Okay, this is force per unit length. Now we can proceed and evaluate the two problems, and finally set this equality in order to find F11. Okay, so these are the results. The contact force is this value, 11,000. And we found this uh, making equal the deflection at the point of contact. So here I have the versus the relative position. So this is X over L. So this is equal to A over A or B, according to if we analyze the, the stiffener or the girder. And we identify that this is the contact point. So this curve is for the girder. So this point here is A over 3, 0.33. It has to be equal to this point, this reflection, which coincides of X divided by B, that's one half because it's in the middle. So this point here has to be equal to that point there. And you see that that's, that's really there. But we see that the shape of the deflection is different. 
for the given for the statement. But at the point of contact, they have to coincide. Once we found this, we could proceed and calculate the shear force, okay? Again, we plot only half because it's symmetric. So this is the shear force for the stiffener. So we start here with the force of the reaction and we go uniformly changing until here. Okay. Uh, for the girder, there is no load except a concentrated force here. So this is the reaction in here. This is uh, constant. And then we have a jump because here I have the concentrated force of contact. And in this part here, since this is equal to the contact force, there is no shear here. And this, this was the, the condition of symmetry that we discussed previously. Okay, and finally, uh, we could plot the bending moment. Okay, so this is the distribution of bending moment of the stiffener, right? So the stiffener goes uh, from <clears throat> a value here, the larger value, Okay, changing the sign, and we get here with the same sign as, as in, the, in the border. And this is what we see here. Okay, something that we insisted in the previous session is that if the gear there would be very, very, very strong, okay, in that case, in that case, the distribution of it, of the bending moment would be symmetric, okay? In that case, this distribution of bending moment will be increases, and then it should go downward. And this point should be equal to this point here. Okay? This would be the case if the girder would be very strong so that you could consider that the stiffener is completely clamped on both ends. Okay? We see that there is a small difference. So it's close to, but it's not quite. We see that we start with a sign, change sign in the central part. In the central part, the bending moment is about half of this. And then we recuperate the sign of the, of the origin, okay? But the value, this value is not the same as this one. So we see that there is some similarity with the extreme case, but it's not quite the same. Okay, now for the girder, okay, for the girder, since we are assuming that the loading acts directly from the contact forces, okay, we see that the, the bending moment changes linearly, okay, to here, and then in the central part of the girder here, there's no shear force, so the bending moment has to be constant. That's what you, you see here, okay? Immediately, we see that the loading that takes the, the girder is much larger than the loading that takes the stiffener. And of course, that's why we need to, since we are considering that the stiffener is being supported by the girder, we need to include more material for the girder than for the stiffener, okay? Uh, people, is there any questions about what I've just reviewed so far? Is there any question about this, this material? Question, people, any question from anybody? No? Doctor. Yeah? Uh, in that case, the points coincide because the lengths are the same. No, this, this, uh, we have to be careful with this graph, okay? Because what I'm plotting here is for the for the stiffener, let me change color here, let me use. Here, this X over L, okay, for the stiffener, it would be X divided by B. And for the girder, it would be X divided by A. Okay, so for the stiffener, I plot from this point until this point only. And for the girder, I plot from here until here. 
So that's why I, I put this, the variable for the x, x uh, axis is x divided by L. So L in general is the dimension in this or in that direction, okay? So they, they are not the same. That's why similarly in this case, similar in this case. So this X over L for the stiffener means X over B. And for the girdler means X over A. Mr. Dominguez? Yes, yeah, doctor, thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, so you see that when we model uh, these uh, reinforced panels, as a grillage, basically we go back to chapter two or chapter one. So basically we go back to solid mechanics and we employ or we apply beam theory in order to solve this combination of, of, uh, of beams, okay? And uh, as you remember, one of the exercises that you had to solve in homework one was this, right? We had two beams like this, and one was uh, clamping on one end, the other end was uh, free. And in the mid, in the center, in the other direction, we have a simply supported beam. So the two were working together. Basically, that's that's what it is. In, 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 in that case, as in this one here, you have to find the contact force between these two beams. And the condition to find it was that the deflection was the same. So this is not new for you. The only uh, new thing is that instead of, usually instead of find, trying to find one force, maybe in this case, for example, you have to find two. But because of symmetry, we were able to, to make it a little bit simpler. Okay, now we were saying that uh, if the, the girder would be very strong, very, very, very strong compared with the stiffener, right? We could assume that this distribution will be like this and with end in this point. In that case, we are basically seeing that the girdler is so stiff, right? That it doesn't deflect much. And in that case, basically the, the stiffener could be assumed as clamped on both ends. And that's, it's a very simple uh, model, very, very simple model uh, to apply, okay? And uh, as a very, uh, uh, as an extreme case, okay? As, as for example, uh, you have no computer or you're, you don't have uh, any program to analyze. That's something that you could do. Take the grillage, okay? And in the grillage, identify the stiffener and assume, assume that the, each one of the stiffeners is clamped on both ends. Probably one end will be on the side or, or in a ball head. And in the other end, we weld it to the girder. But we're assuming that the girder is so strong that we could assume that both ends are clamped. And proceed. It's a simple beam uniform load, so you could assume it. And immediately you remember chapter one that the, on the both ends, bending moment will be PL squared over 12. And in the central part, bending moment will be PL squared over 24, but with different sign. Okay, so it's, it's very simple. And then we could also consider that the girder that it's supporting the load from the stiffener could be considered as a clamped beam, okay? But the span will be much larger, okay? And uniform load acting on it. So again, it's a PL squared over 12 on the ends, PL squared over 24 with different sign in the central part. It's a very simplistic approach, but uh, we can do it if we have nothing else that we could, could use in order to analyze this type of, of systems. Okay, for example, here, okay? So this is my, my stiffener, and I'm going to assume 
that uh, it is clamped here and it's also clamped here. So this is a simple beam. I take the spacing between stiffener multiplied by the pressure and that would be my uniform load acting on it. And then I go from here all the way up to here. And again, I assume that the contact force here, here, and here, since they are a good number, quickly good number, we could assume that the, the loading acting on, on, on the girder would be considered as a uniform load. Okay, and that force would be equal to the pressure times the spacing between girders. Clamp it, clamp it. Of course, the distance between these two points of clamp are more far apart than in the previous case. So you can expect the bending moment acting on the girder will be much larger. And of course, the dimensions to, to design it will be, to define it will be much larger too. Okay, so this is a very simplistic approach. This is a summary of that. Clamp it from here to here, uniform load. Clamp it here and here, and you can take this, this, that, and just consider it as a uniform load, and that's it. So again, this is very simplistic way that uh, we could apply. Okay, any questions about this, people? Any question? Okay, hopefully, if I give you some of these uh, exercises in the final evaluation, okay, if I just give you that and I ask you a very, in a very simple way, analyze this, this is what you have to do. On the contrary, if I mention, for example, the contact forces or something like that, that means that you have to consider the both the deflect and the height you have to solve the combination of the two uh, equations for the girders and for stiffness and set up this, the deflection in the point of contact being equal, okay? Hopefully there will be no, uh, no doubt, no confusion about what uh, I'm required. Okay, um, this is just a, another extra slide about this. Okay, so in this case, I'm showing two girders and one, two, three, and four stiffeners. This is the spacing between stiffeners. This is spacing between girders. And what we do is we consider this uh, piece of the, gear, the stiffener between this point and that point, and we consider them as clamped. Okay, loading here would be equal to the pressure times the spacing between stiffeners, okay? In that case, the maximum shear force will be equal to the half of the total load applied to the stiffener. And this would be the maximum bending moment and that will occur here or here, it will be the same. In the central part, remember, bending moment will be half of that and opposite sign. And then we can analyze the girder all of this, all of this. Uh, again, this is going to be this, the spacing. Uh, the spacing times the pressure will give us the uniform load. Instead of having one, two, three, four, we assume that this, since this four is a good number, we can assume that the load is, can be assumed as uniformly applied on the girder too. And again, the formulations are the same. We have to be careful with the load per unit length, and we have to be careful with the span or the length of the span of each element. Okay, this is for the stiffener. This is for the girders. Okay, doctor, could you repeat why the pressure of the girder is on that way? It's, it's yeah. the same. It's the same. The pressure is the same, but you multiply by the spacing between stiffeners to get force per unit length on the stiffener. And you use the same value of pressure and multiply by the space between girders. But uh, the pressure is the same. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, the stiffeners are on the, gird on the girders and the, and the girder uh, receive the force of the stiffener. Yeah, yeah. 
see what I'm what I'm saying is this. Let me write here. Okay, let's draw. This is the girder. Okay. Okay, this is the girder. We assume that it is clamped here and it is clamped here. In this case, I have uh, one, two, three, and four. These are the stiffeners, right? According to the model of Grillich theory, we will receive one force of contact, two, three, and four. But we can consider that that it's approximately equal to this. We have is the same girder, clamp it, clamp it. But instead of having one, two, three, four, we assume that it is uniformly distributed. And what we are doing is this, okay. This this uh, this is stiffener, okay. For example, this one here, this is stiffener, takes this load and apply it into here. Takes this part and apply it into here. Similarly, for this one, for this, and for that. This is the graph that we are showing here. Now, instead of that. We could assume that this girder will take this load here, all of this load. And if you assume that, in that case, you could consider that this is a beam. And in that case, this load will, can be considered as uniform and the value will be equal to the pressure times the spacing between girders. Okay, so this is a simplification, yes. This should be more precise to analyze. This is a good, a good approximation. If the number of girder, if the stiffness is good and high enough, which is usually the case. How much have to be the number of the? <laughs> Don't ask me that. <laughs> but you have to do is you can consider you can calculate both and compare the difference. Okay. I would say, for example, uh, three or four. A, a, Stiffness would be a good a good number. If you have only one stiffener, it's it's difficult to assume that it's uniformly distributed. Okay. Okay. No problem. No problem. Any other any other question, people? Uh, yes, doctor. What is S S S G? Is the spacing spacing between the girders? Spacing right? between girders. Spacing. Yeah, okay. S sub G okay. is a spacing between girders. S sub, uh, let me write it here. So you have S sub G is a spacing between girders. S sub S is a spacing between stiffness. And we're, we're expecting the spacing between the stiffeners to be much smaller than the spacing between the others. Okay. Now we have to be careful. Remember the directions are different. And that depends on the type of framing that you're using for the ship structure. Okay. Now here, there, there are some relations which are very interesting, right? And we, can start trying to understand what the classification societies do, okay? For example, for the design of the stiffeners, okay? After you have found the maximum bending moment, uh, you divide it by the uh, sectional modulus of the section, and the result is the maximum stress, right? Now, that this is the equation that we would apply if you were analyzing, okay? This is to analyze. If you want to design something, okay? In that case, what do you do? You try to find the dimensions of the stiffener or the girder. 
In that case, this is what you apply. So to this sign, what you do? You take a permissible or a maximum uh, stress. That's one thing. Then you make a quick or a, a preliminary sketch of the structure. So, okay, you say, okay, I'm going to use this many girders, this many stiffness, okay? You estimate the load. You can apply, for example, in homework one or two, you, you apply the formulations from BNV to estimate the pressure, right? So you could estimate the bending moment because you have the, the, the span, the spacing, and the, and the pressure. So you can estimate the bending moment. And with this, two uh, with this relation, bending moment divided by the permissible stress, you could determine how much section modulus you need for the system. And then you start simply doing, right? Okay, you say, okay, I'm going to use this BE, I'm going to use this H, and I'm going to use this W. And then you select the thicknesses. And what do you do? You start by a trial and error, right? So you use a height with thickness, calculate inertia, calculate section models, and compare with the value that is required. When the value that you have really designed is larger than the required, you are okay. If you are below, that means that the stress will be higher than the permissible. And probably you, this, this structure can fail. In that case, what you need to do is to increase. For example, you could increase the height or you could increase the width of the flange or the thickness. Until finally, you have that the, the design value of the section modulus is larger than the value of the required one. Okay, that's... Now, let's see uh, if, if we follow this assumption that uh, we consider that the stiffener, for example, is completely clamped on both ends, okay? In that case, we know that the bending moment, maybe we can recall here, if we have a clamped, clamped, and we have a uniform load, and this is P0, and here, the bending moment is going to be something, remember the deflection will be something like this, like that. So here we have negative bending moment, go like this, and then we go back to this value. So this is the maximum, and this is what you have. In this case, P0 is going to be equal to the pressure times the spacing. So we have this from here, to here, this is L, and that's it. Now, so this is the maximum bending moment. We can replace this into here. And now we can deduce an expression for the required section modulus of the stiffener. So it's going to be equal to pressure, pressure times the spacing between stiffeners. This is the span, the distance from here to here. And in the denominator, we have 12, and this is the permissible stress. Okay. Uh, for example, here I, I need this. This uh, this is an exercise that we could develop. Okay. Let's suppose I the pressure. I express it in kilonewtons per meter square. The spacing and the length, of course, they are easily expressed in meters. And the classical units to express stress is newtons per millimeter squared, megapascals. What we can do now is just to make a transformation of units. Let's, let's try to see if we can follow me, okay? I have one kilonewtons is equal to 1,000 newtons. So I can cancel this. I can cancel that. That and I can go on. Here I have millimeter square. Okay. What we can do is we can transform 
And the most common unit to express the required uh, section model is cubic centimeters. Okay, so let's transform it, all of this. Okay, so we go and say, okay, one meter is uh, 100 centimeters, and this is raised to the third power. Right? And down here, we have that uh, uh, well, we have millimeters in the numerator. So we have that uh, uh, what? one meter is equal to 10, sorry, to 1,000 millimeters. Okay. So uh, I have millimeter square, so I cancel this with that. I have meter cube, I cancel with that. And I remember that I had this one over 12 here. So what I have to do here is, you see, I have 1000, I'm sorry, 100 to the third power. So this is 10 to the sixth. And again, this is 1000 to the second power. So this, cancels that. So the result is just 1,000 divided by 12. Pressure in kilonewtons per meter square, S in meters, length square, meter square, and the stress in megapascals. And the result is going to be S in centimeters Centimeter, cubic centimeters. Please use your calculator and divide 1,000 divided by 12. Please, anybody, give me a number. Mr. Villalba, do you have a calculator? Mr. Villalba, can you hear me? Yes, Do you have a calculator? Yes, 83.5. Eighty-three Okay, so it's going to be eighty-three if I if I listen correctly. Anybody else could confirm me, please? Confirm me eighty-three. Yes, eighty-three. Eight point eighty-three. So. Okay, so it's it's about eighty-three. Okay, so, so if I if if I put instead of this, I put eighty-three. I multiply by the pressure in kilonewtons per meter square, S and L in meters, and divided by this allowable stress in megapascals, the result is going to be the required section modulus in cubic centimeters, okay? And that's, you, you see here, uh, we are using very, very, very simple relation from solid mechanics. Now let's see what the classification society has to say about it. They say that the section modulus of the bottom inner bottom frames is this. And you see immediately that uh, uh, we have L squared, S, P, and W. But in this case, I am not, uh, I do not see, okay, this, uh, the allowable stress in the denominator. Okay, uh, and this I took it from uh, from the classification rules DNB for ships with length less than a hundred meters. Okay, now if I go back to this equation, okay, so I I I said that the required is equal to eighty three times uh, L square P S divided by sigma. Now, WK, this is a corrosion allowance. That means that you have to increase the, the dimensions of the section because after a few months, the corrosion will take some material out. So we have to increase it when we build the ship, right? So if we say that this is equal to one, we are just considering that it is just the structural part that we are considering, okay? Now, 
if we compare these two expressions, that means that the sigma 83 divided by sigma is equal to 0 0.63. So in this expression, okay, DNV doesn't tell me that, but in this expression, the allowable stress is equal to 83 divided by 0 0.63. Anybody please help me with these values? Anybody? 131. 100 and? 131.75. 100. Okay, so this is 131 megapascal. So, so that's the allowable stress that they are using. So it, it's about half of the uh, yield point of a common uh, structural steel. So makes sense, makes sense that uh, they use this, this, these values. And here there is a, it's another application, okay? And this is taken in this case is for the bottom longitudinals, right? And specifically, you see that this expression is the same as, as ours. And the constant that they're using is 83. So this is exactly the expression that we have before, except by the corrosion allowance. That means that basically this is just considering that the bottom longitudinal is a stiffener clamped on both ends. Any questions about this so far, people? Any question? Yes, doctor. Um... On that behavior due to the change of reference system, do we have to consider that the sub phase on the deflection is a positive moment? No, no. The only thing that you have to do is to consider that the, the deflection has to be the same. But the form of this it is, deflection. It is possible. For example, if I want to give you a hard time, okay, you are student of the best university in Ecuador, right? So I can give you a very strong, a strange a loading. See, for example, I can give you in some points forces upward and in other parts, I can give you pressure pointing downward. So the deflection is going to be strange. You don't know if it is, the deflection is going to be positive or negative in the contact points. What we know is that in this contact point, if I evaluate the reflection, considering the stiffener, that value has to be exactly the same if we consider the girder at the point of contact. Positive or negative, I don't care, but it has to be the same. In the next uh, slide, okay. you uh, configurate the moment, the vendor moment, to you. Yeah, but remember that for that, for the sign of the bending moment, you have to be careful because, uh, for example, let me go back to the previous slide here, okay? So in this case, let me use different colors for, for the girder and for the stiffener, okay? So I'm going to use this color for the stiffener. Okay, so this is my X, and let's suppose this is a bending moment for the stiffener. Okay, so if I make a cut, okay, if make a cut here, okay, the bending moment is going to be positive like that. Now, let's do the analysis of the girder. So I'm, I'm going to change color, okay? So let's use green. Now this is my X and this is the bending moment. If I make a cut here, okay, this is the piece that I, I'm analyzing. So the bending moment positive is going to be like that because this is a positive phase. And this is also, uh, here, this is also a positive phase, but this X is different than this X. 
we have to be careful. That's all. Okay, so in one case, the stress will be pointing. In the case of the stiffener, okay, let, let's use, uh, let's suppose this is x, global x, and this is global y. The stiffeners will generate stresses in the y direction while the girders will generate normal stresses in the X global direction. That's, that's very important when we have to, the next step is to combine the three. Yeah, the, the question was because uh, on the primary behavior, uh, the sign convention of the, of the moments change for yeah. the other, for the other, uh, you see, what I, what I do, what I do, usually do is, okay, yeah, the sign is important and all of that. What I do is I prefer to draw an arrow. And in the arrow, I'm considering the sign to avoid these, these problems. Okay, so if you have the, the primary response, you have negative bending moment, right? something like that. So that means that the deck is in compression. You just draw it in compression and that's it. Okay. Santos? Yeah, Dr. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay, finally, before we leave this, this topic, okay, this, uh, this little uh, information, this little pieces of information, we're taken directly from the classification rules, okay? And here, we found something interesting, okay? There are some comments here about the value, okay? The value of the allowable stress that goes here says that you have to use a value of 95 if ZB is equal to sigma R. If you can take 160 if ZB is larger than twice ZR. What are these? Okay, now ZB and ZR are values of the section modulus of the whole section, okay? So Z, B, or R are a whole section modulus for the whole thing. I mean, you have the deck, you have the side, longitudinal bulk heads, bottom, double bottom, all of this. And with all of this, you calculate Z. Remember, Z is the section modulus. So you consider or you calculate the bending moment divided by the section modulus, and this quotient gives you this normal stress, okay? At the deck, at the side, or the bottom. That's Z, section modulus. Now, you have two options, B and R, okay? And R or B is as built. R is the required. So you apply the, the rule, classification rule, and that will give you a value for the required section modulus. But it is possible, right, that when you build the ship, put more material than the required. Uh, for example, you try to buy a plate for the deck. Okay, and you have calculated and you have selected a thickness of 6.5 millimeters, but you go to the store and there is no 6.5. You can find either six or seven. Which one would you select? Of course, seven to be safe. But if you put seven instead of 6.5 that you calculated, that means that the section modulus of the sex of, the, of your ship hull, as it was really built, is larger than the required. 
If the section modulus of the hull is larger, that means that the normal stress, the primary normal stress will be lower. Okay? And that when this, this relation comes. Okay, let, let's suppose that we have here, we have that, and we have a bending moment. And here I have Z, B. It's the section models as the, the structure was really built. Okay. Now, what we're saying here is that if you build the ship exactly with the required section modulus, the stress that you have to apply here is only, you, you have to apply here is 95. This is megapascals, right? Now, what would happen if you use a much larger section model? Okay, now if we see here, for example, this would be generating a sigma super one. Now, if we build the structure with a much larger section modulus, that means that the stress will be reduced. If the primary stress reduces, that means that the normal stress in the secondary behavior could be increased. And we see that in here. If you use a much stronger whole structure, primary normal stress will be smaller. So secondary actual stress could be increased from 95 to 160. See, you see that they, they, they consider all of these uh, possibilities, okay? Because at the end, what we have to do, and we will see that in, in, in uh, what we have to do is we have to consider that the three behaviors, they have to be combined at the end, okay? Oh, any questions about this? And this is within 0 0.4 of L. Okay, that's in the central part of the ship. Okay, midship uh, between plus and minus 0.2 L. Because remember that that's something that we mentioned in one of the previous classes is that in the midship area, we have the larger bending moments, the largest bending moments. Okay, about L over four, three quarters of L over four, we have the larger shear forces. In the central part, we have the larger bending moments in this area, 0.4 of L in the central part of the ship. Okay, uh, let me ask you for uh, a couple of minutes to, to have some water to recuperate my throat, and then we will continue, okay, with chapter, four, uh, with sub chapter 5.4, okay? so. Isaac, would you please stop the recording?